Hey, what up? Kit Talk here. Today's story is a little different than normal. It's a very long one. And this story is from 4chan, and it's about a cryptid or supernatural creature that the author calls the White Man. I know it sounds a little racist to call the title of the video The White Man, but a guy in Michigan had a strange supernatural encounter with a creature similar to the rake or the dover demon some kind of tall lanky white looking creature that would come out in winter now i'll let you guys judge this story for yourself it seems that he had some kind of weird relationship with this creature the author was the is the guy's son and he's writing about his father who passed away i'm gonna let you guys judge for yourself what you think of this story and I know this is a little different than my usual videos because this story is quite long. And because this story is so long, I'm only going to include this one story, which is 32 minutes long. So without further ado, here's a story about a strange creature that the father of the author calls the white man. On a solemn Sunday, my father bid farewell to this world, just a few days shy of his 55th birthday in April. Our bond had never been strong, but there were no ill feelings between us. We simply found little common ground, and I must admit that I didn't make much effort to bridge that divide. I operated under the illusion that we had all the time in the world, and his robust health made me complacent, leading me to visit him less often than I should have. It's been three years since I last saw him, and expressing this fact in the past tense is challenging. Now, overwhelmed by guilt and longing, I yearn to connect with his memory, to unravel his story, and to seek answers about an enigma he often spoke of as the white man. I should mention that this figure has no connection to Native American heritage. It's not a symbol of land appropriation. My father was the epitome of a suburban dad, unremarkable, with typical interests like fishing, hunting, and bowling. He had a standard attire with Crocs and turtlenecks, and he drove a hatchback with a vanity plate. However, beneath this facade of affluence, his rustic roots were never far from sight. He grew up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan during the turbulent 60s, raised by a family entrenched in poverty and extreme religiosity. I never met most of his relatives except for his brother, Philly, who played a significant role in the events I'm about to recount. From what I've heard, their lives resembled something out of the movie Deliverance, set against the backdrop of frosty winters. Living in a former cabin, their meager income came from rearing pigs, chickens, and selling timber. My father's childhood was marked by his own father's drunken outbursts, leaving him with both physical and emotional scars. Please forgive me if my storytelling becomes erratic. I'm writing as I remember. And I admit I'm also indulging in a bit of liquor to keep warm during this cold night. Importantly, my father wasn't an intellectual powerhouse. He was simple, earnest, and incapable of spinning intricate tales. Yet, it's his simple narratives that I ask you to consider. He often spoke about the white man to my sister and me, but discreetly avoided sharing these tales with my mother in Philly. He seemed to fear ridicule from Philly and skepticism from my mother, who he thought might question his sanity. In our childhood, the white man embodied our worst nightmares. A shapeshifter, capable of transforming into anyone or anything, retaining only his distinct whiteness. Despite his humanoid appearance, he bore an animalistic nature. He was a harbinger of misfortune particularly interested in striking deals with his chosen ones. My father's first encounter with this entity happened during a hunting trip with Philly in January. A simple excursion quickly turned into a survival ordeal as darkness fell, and the two young boys lost their way in the dense woods. To make matters worse, they unwittingly walked onto a snow-blanketed pond, and the thin ice gave way under their weight, leaving them drenched in freezing water. Exhausted, cold, and disoriented, they sought shelter beneath a tree, taking turns to keep warm, while the other faced the harsh elements. Philly's version of the story is more mundane, as he simply recounts being lost and eventually finding their way back home. However, my father's account adds an uncanny twist to the tale. He described the sound of approaching footsteps, distinctly human in nature. Soon after, an ethereal figure appeared, white as snow, and nearly nine feet tall with a Gumby-like form. The creature communicated with my father telepathically, introducing itself as an ancient being that thrived in the cold. It appeared to those who were injured or lost, ready to guide them to the afterlife. The creature showed no interest in the dead, only the dying. Their communication was unnerving yet strangely benign. Then the white man made an offer, follow it willingly, 
or freeze in the cold. My father, driven by a strong will to survive, negotiated. They would be allowed to leave, but their lives were now on borrowed time. The creature would return someday to collect its due. Following this agreement, the white man led them out of the woods, manifesting as a white rabbit and leaving a trail for them to follow. They eventually found their way back to civilization, and their harrowing adventure came to a relieving end. I must clarify that while I don't fully endorse my father's account, I believe he sincerely believed in his experiences. Perhaps it stemmed from a local legend he heard while growing up, or it could simply be a product of his imagination. Philly, on the other hand, dismissed it as pure fabrication. In his version, they simply got lost, narrowly escaped death, and managed to return home. The only parts he agreed with were the rabbit tracks and the larger indents in the snow, which he attributed to my father's overactive imagination. A year passed before my father encountered the white man again, which shook him enough to share his bizarre tale with Philly. Another winter night with a white blanket of snow brought the memories rushing back. My father, accompanied only by his faithful dog Shorty, was tending to the hogs on that chilly night. As a child, my father only had two confidants, Philly, a childhood friend, and his dog, a basset beagle mix named Shorty. He often emphasized his bond with these two when reminiscing about his early years, making me curious about his relationship with his sisters. But since I had never met them, I could only infer that they weren't as close. In the pig barn that night, my father and Shorty were together. The barn was far enough from their house so that during summer, the unpleasant odors of manure and pigs didn't reach the living quarters. The barn had two entrances, and during the warmer months, the back door was left ajar for the hogs to roam outdoors. However, in winter, the barn was tightly sealed. Finding the back door wide open on that chilly night surprised my father. It had happened a few times over the years, usually resulting in a chase for the escapee pigs, who even in cold weather would venture out in search of food or mischief. But that night, all the hogs were huddled far from the door, refusing to step out even under a clear sky. My father assumed that the hogs had become sensible and didn't want to face the harsh weather. He ventured through the pen to secure the door, with Shorty following close behind. As they reached the door, Shorty sniffed around before dashing out and barking ferociously, chasing after an unseen entity. Shorty was renowned for his vigilance, intervening whenever something was awry. So, my father initially thought Shorty was merely disciplining a rogue pig. But upon counting the hogs, he discovered that one, an adult boar, was missing. Undeterred by the chilling cold, my father followed Shorty's footprints in the snow in search of the lost pig. This was when he noticed an eerie discrepancy. While Shorty's tracks were clear, the boar's tracks were missing. Instead, there were large, peculiar indentations in the snow. These strange marks in the snow reminded my father of tracks he had seen the previous winter. Convinced that Shorty was on the trail of the creature, my father decided to follow suit. As terrified as he was, he knew he had to recover Shorty and the hog, or he would face his father's wrath. Navigating through the snow-covered hog pen, he eventually reached the fence, constructed of five-foot-tall hog panels. Shorty had already scaled the fence and ventured into the woods, clearly pursuing the creature. Astonishingly, the tracks of the creature transcended the fence, indicating it had effortlessly leaped over it. Summoning his courage, my father followed suit, venturing into the wooded region, which seemed eerily still. It wasn't long before the harrowing sounds of Shorty's barks and the boar's squeals echoed through the quietude. He found himself confronting the creature he had come to know as the White Man, towering and seeming even larger than before. In one arm, it held the struggling boar, its weight amounting to around 400 pounds. A few feet away, Shorty, his fur standing on end, was barking relentlessly as if he had cornered the creature. The chilling realization that the white man had a mouth hit my father when the creature flashed a toothy grin. The teeth were as white as its body, shining ominously in the moonlight. Then, just as suddenly as it had appeared, the creature vanished leaving only the faint crunch of snow behind it. My father called Shorty back, and together they trudged home, my father shedding tears of fear and relief throughout the journey. Unsurprisingly, he faced a reprimand for losing a hog, but he wisely chose not to divulge his encounter with the white man. He confided only in Philly, who initially seemed skeptical but did not challenge his friend's account. As time passed, Philly attributed my father's encounters with the white man to a potential mental disorder, implying that the creature was merely a hallucination. I have limited understanding of mental health, so I cannot evaluate the validity of Philly's theory. Years went by before my father encountered the white man again. However, he claimed to sense the creature's presence during each winter when, invariably, a hog or a bunch of chickens would mysteriously disappear overnight. The only deviation from this pattern occurred when a local boy vanished in the woods, and that year, none of the farm's hogs disappeared. 
Based on the nature of the disappearances and the creature's unsettlingly sharp teeth, my father speculated that the white man had a carnivorous diet. He never received any direct confirmation from the creature itself, but the circumstantial evidence led him to believe so. In the year they decided to leave the farm, my father and Philly found themselves caught in an enormous storm that had churned off the lakes, bringing a ferocious mix of snow and wind. They woke up to find their barn roof crumpled like a tin can. Their pigs scattered or perished, with one pig's carcass lodged high in a tree as if a colossal hand had tossed it there. Oddly enough, their neighbors seemed to have been spared from such disaster. The following year, their financial situation worsened, exacerbating their struggles. Their predicaments intensified when a chicken shed collapsed due to an unidentified mound of debris, effectively releasing the poultry into the wild. A tempest the succeeding year toppled trees, demolishing their sawmill and putting an end to their lumber business. Then, a year later, an immense ancient tree crushed a car beneath its weight. The list of misfortunes went on. The only year that seemed free of catastrophe was the last winter when my father, while feeding their newly procured hogs, collapsed and died on his way home. This news shook my father deeply. He couldn't admit to his mother that it was the work of the white man, yet he couldn't completely dismiss the white man's role either. Part of him couldn't shake off the feeling that there was a connection, as if an unpaid debt were catching up to him and the debt collector had missed him. In haste, he assisted his mother in relocating and selling their few remaining valuables. Before the chill of winter returned, he found himself safely back in Texas, where they enjoyed a brief warm winter devoid of snow, during which he met my mother. Ironically, they got married a year later in January, and what's more, her birthday fell in December. My father, however, always relished the prospect of joyous events in winter, so it didn't bother him in the slightest. By now, the cold had set in, though the snow had yet to make its appearance. One night, a few days before Thanksgiving, he woke up to the sight of ice outside their house. Within the ice, he claimed to have spotted a slightly darker figure, a vague humanoid creature. His fear returned in full force. Either he was losing his sanity, or he was being taunted before the first snowfall. When the snow finally did start to fall a few days later, precisely on Thanksgiving Day, he became unhinged. My grandparents, an affluent family with many members, would host grand celebrations for every holiday. Thanksgiving was arguably their grandest festivity, and everyone had been planning and preparing for it for weeks. By the eve of the event, guests had started to arrive, and by Thursday afternoon, the house was bustling with activity. It was around this time that the snow began to fall. In a state of panic, my father approached the window to witness the gray skies and the snow gently descending. He switched off the pregame event everyone had been engrossed in to check the weather forecast, which naturally annoyed the crowd. Aware of his Texan background and the lingering southern drawl, people questioned if he had never witnessed snow before. My mother reassured them that he was a Michigan native and no stranger to snow. It's just that he didn't care much for it. His panic only intensified, and people either made light of his situation or grew increasingly concerned. His problem wasn't just the white man. It was that he was in debt to the white man that the white man was irate, and that he was stuck in a house filled with 40 people while grappling with the white man. My mother eventually led him away to their bedroom, where they were staying. After a brief spat, she instructed him to remain there until he had regained his composure or dinner was served, much like a child being sent to time out. My father, among other things, was a man of compliance, so he didn't resist and found himself confined to a smaller space. Unfortunately, the room overlooked a vast backyard, enclosed by a short iron fence that directly led into the unoccupied woods. As the snow piled up and darkness enveloped the landscape, his anxiety soared. His time was divided between keeping the vigilant watch over the yard and the woods and trying to ignore their existence altogether. Finally, around 7 p.m., he was brought downstairs to dine. But his isolation had backfired. His nerves were more frazzled than ever, and it was palpable. I could delve into the details of the dinner, but it's irrelevant to the narrative. Suffice to say, it didn't proceed smoothly, and he was dismissed back to his room well before anyone else had finished. Darkness had now settled, and part of him anticipated the white man's appearance as soon as night fell. But the white man kept him waiting, as if primping for a date. Hours crawled by and he kept a watchful eye on the window, with the merriment downstairs as his only companion. Gradually, he began to regain a modicum of calm. Perhaps the white man wouldn't show up. Maybe all he could do was make an obscure appearance when he was this far from home. Feeling relieved, my father decided to make a trip to the bathroom. But on his return, he caught a fleeting glimpse of white against the trees. His heart plummeted, his fear resurfaced, yet he knew he had to investigate. Indeed, the white man was emerging from the woods, traversing the snow-covered field. He was smaller now than my father had ever seen him, 
but he still towered over a man. The creature halted at the fence and directed its gaze toward him. My father was certain that the white man was aware of his presence and desired something, yet was hesitant to approach. For an extended moment, they locked eyes. It was apparent that the white man was prepared to wait until he stepped outside, and something compelled him to do just that, to confront it and get it over with. It took him some time, but eventually he gathered his courage and decided to do just that. He wouldn't succumb to its control. He would scream if it dared to touch him. Surely, with a house full of 40 people, it would drop him and flee, or they would rush out to his rescue. People didn't just disappear like that, and there were no reports of a snow monster fatally attacking someone in their yard. With this rationale, he got dressed and headed downstairs. By this point, many of the partygoers were either drunk or had retired to their rooms or left, and his venture into the backyard went unnoticed. One would think that given his belief that they would come to his rescue in case of an incident, he would have stayed indoors, considering they were too inebriated to even notice his departure. But he pressed on regardless. At this juncture, six inches of snow had blanketed the ground, and snow was still falling heavily. It was a severe storm, especially for this time of year, and it seemed to empower the creature. The incident, ironically, convinced my mother to remain close to her parents. In case of any other medical issues, she wanted to be near them and the doctors she grew up with. My father reluctantly agreed, saying, I might as well have moved back home or to Alaska. The following year, during a severe snowstorm, one of my uncles from my mother's side, she had two brothers, drove off a bridge. They only recovered his car in the spring, and unfortunately the body was no longer inside. The year after that, my grandfather lost both his German shepherds from their locked pen in an outdoor kennel. The dogs seemed to vanish without a trace. Then, in the third year, our family experienced no loss, but two locals went missing during an ill-timed camping trip. My father was a deeply religious man. Whenever things went well, he would thank Jesus or God. Conversely, if something went awry during the colder months, he often attributed it to the white man's fault. He believed this mysterious entity had followed him from Michigan to Pennsylvania, and now had taken an interest in this new location. The logic behind this belief was something I never quite understood. Did this entity haunt people all over the world, or at least in America? Were all missing persons in the winter months victims of the white man? Or was it just connected to my father? Had it truly relocated across the country just for him? Once, I asked my father about these questions, but he couldn't provide any definitive answers. All he knew was that it seemed to follow him like a curse. The winter before I was born marked the next encounter my father had with the white man. As I mentioned earlier, my mother came from a wealthy background. When she found out she couldn't have children, a fact that didn't bother her, she even joked that her diagnosis was good news. Her parents, who were more traditional, bought her a puppy to help ease her pain and serve as a child substitute. The puppy was a papered borzoi, imported from Russia, and it cost a substantial amount. Despite my mother's apparent disinterest in having children, she adored the dog, and the feelings seemed mutual. This sometimes caused my father to feel jealous, as he believed his wife loved the dog more than him. When winter arrived that fourth year, my father grew anxious, as he did every year. Something had been taken each year, even if not directly from him, and he always feared that the white man might take his wife or a close friend. Halfway through December, a heavy snowstorm struck, leaving them with two feet of snow. It was at that point my father became convinced that the white man would appear. Our Borzoi was a majestic creature, pure white, incredibly fast, and with a penchant for chasing anything that moved. These details are essential for understanding the events that followed. House trained to the extreme, the dog refused to relieve himself indoors, even during the harshest winter months. While this made him easy to housebreak, it posed a challenge during severe weather when he needed to go outside. During the middle of the storm, the dog began whining. My father, though usually a gentleman who doted on my mother, refused to walk the dog in the snow under any circumstances. He considered it cowardice, but he simply couldn't bear being alone in the cold. To ensure my mother wasn't alone either, he had fenced in a large yard for the dog. Out went the dog, tethered to a leash because he couldn't be trusted off it during bad weather. My mother waited by the door, a habit that annoyed my father as she wouldn't close it. After a few moments, the dog started barking, which was unusual for bourgeois, who were typically quiet and timid. Concerned, my mother followed the dog outside. What happened next was what my father recounted to me, so I'll do my best to retell it accurately. The snow had accumulated and some of it was shoveled against the fence to clear a pathway, creating a ramp. Along the fence line, something big moved away so quickly that all my mother saw was a flash of whiter than white against the snow. It was this entity that our dog had been barking at from atop the ramp. When it fled, the dog gave chase. My father claimed that what my mother saw was the white man although she dismissed it as a cat or some other animal in the wrong place at the wrong time. Nevertheless, 
the dog was gone. Panicked, my mother rushed inside, screaming that the dog had disappeared and they had to find it quickly before it froze to death. My father hesitated making excuses, but eventually, he couldn't resist my mother's pleas and went with her, shotgun in hand just in case. They followed the rapidly fading footprints of the dog, with my father growing more apprehensive about the additional set of tracks he noticed, vague and dense that only someone familiar with the white man would recognize. Nevertheless, he trudged on with my mother, feeling like a scared child being stalked as the trail led them into the woods. My father had never liked the northern weather, and Pennsylvania's woods held a particular unease for him. They felt empty and eerily quiet. As they delved deeper into the woods, the dog's trail became clearer, transitioning from a run to a walk. My mother continued to call and squeak the toy, convinced the dog would be just around the corner, but they kept going deeper into the woods, seemingly endlessly, just like my father's childhood experience of being lost in unfamiliar woods. Eventually, he almost convinced my mother to turn back, but then they heard a low whine, like a dog in pain. She spotted a glimpse of snow, white fur, and her flashlight beam. My mother hurried after the dog, calling and squeaking the toy, while my father hesitated behind, knowing he had to follow her. He noticed something peculiar. The dog's footprints stopped, but the vague and dense continued. He called out to her, but she didn't listen and kept running. The path took them further from home, and my father knew they were likely being watched. The fear of being lost and not found right away in those woods was very real. It was an ideal place for luring cursed soul away. According to my father, my mother would occasionally catch a glimpse of the dog, just a white outline or the fluff of its tail. Whenever she felt hopeless, the dog would reappear. But eventually she lost sight of it, and they heard a snapping sound followed by a yelp from the dog that sounded all too familiar. The sound carried by the wind made it impossible to determine the animal's location. Then nothing. The trail ended and there were no more prints. The dog didn't come back, no matter how much my mother called for it. My father caught up, claiming the trail continued, and she must have misunderstood what she was seeing. But they found the dog's snapped collar hanging on a branch, a sign my father interpreted as the debt being paid for another year. Emotionally and physically exhausted, my mother asked my father to check the backyard for the dog while she prepared for the night. Reluctantly, he agreed. Along the back fence, he spotted a massive white figure, blocking out the moon's natural light. The white man was waiting, ready to make another contract, its white teeth glistening in an almost smile. Without words, they communicated once more. Do you want to be free of your debt? Well, of course, my father answered, although he felt uneasy about what the white man might propose. There was something unsettling about how it spoke, even if it wasn't with audible words. After the last deal they made, he wasn't sure he wanted to agree. He thought about it for a moment and refused. Do you want to be free of your debt? Well, of course, my father answered, although he felt uneasy about what the white man might propose. There was something unsettling about how it spoke, even if it wasn't with audible words. After the last deal they made, he wasn't sure he wanted to agree. He thought about it for a moment and refused. The white man seemed displeased, its frown taking on an otherworldly form. Well, that's unfortunate. It remarked before simply vanishing into the snow. My father returned inside, and the dog never showed up again. That spring, my mother's parents bought her another bourgeois, this one black, this dog whom I grew up with, was fortunately less regal and noble, and didn't mind urinating inside during inclement weather. My father had multiple conversations with the white man, but they didn't involve spoken words. It was a form of telepathy, or some other communication method beyond language. The sentences were roughly translated into words, but there was no precise wording, and I won't try to make it sound great, considering it wasn't in the King's English or any human language. As previously mentioned, I came into this world in the following year. My parents did not practice birth control a fact that I am regretfully certain of. My mother was steadfast in her teachings about the birds and the bees, using their misstep as a cautionary tale. To their credit, they never expected they could have children. However, a miracle unfolded. Me. My parents were blissfully unaware until it was undeniable, later in the pregnancy. Their visit to the doctor revealed not only was my mother pregnant, but she was expecting twins. Twins were a recurring theme in my mother's lineage, with almost every generation birthing at least one pair. As a twin herself, my mother wasn't taken aback by this revelation, and so my parents adjusted their plans accordingly. The anticipation was palpable, especially for my father, who had always dreamt of a large family. What wasn't thrilling for him was my mother's mid-February due date. Throughout the year, my mother, and particularly my uncle, ribbed him playfully. His sons were going to arrive in the heart of winter. How would his worst fear react? Such jesting, predictably, didn't amuse my father one bit. As the due date neared, my father's nervousness amplified, even though there were no visible complications with the pregnancy. 
Still, he was gripped by the feeling that something was bound to happen. As it turned out in late January, it did. A storm descended, causing intermittent power outages. Amid the chaos, my mother went into labor. Even though her due date was a month away, she knew this wasn't a false alarm and insisted on going to the hospital, despite the dire condition. Even though my father dreaded winter, snow, driving, and especially driving in snowy winters, he consented immediately. He had been mentally prepared for some misfortune, and thus girded his loins and went to heat the car. Regrettably, if the mythical white man was real, he seemed equally prepared for a confrontation. Stepping outside, my father noticed two things. The first, and most frightening, were the familiar imprints in the snow, the ghostly footprints of the white man. The second was the severe weather, which would have been a more rational concern. The sky was densely clouded, obscuring the moon and eradicating any natural light. Coupled with the piercing cold, forceful wind, and intense snowfall, the drive would be arduous. A rational person would have dialed an ambulance, particularly if they were averse to winter driving. However, my father felt safer driving my mother himself, believing that he would lessen the white man's chances of creating trouble. So, once the car was heated, he guided my mother into it and set off for the hospital. Bear in mind, this was over two decades ago. We lived in the new suburbs outside the city, and the hospital was roughly a 20-minute drive, in ideal conditions. Given the weather, it was bound to take longer. Though a hospital was eventually built closer to our home, I was born in what could be called the recent dark ages. The journey was off to a rocky start. The car was reluctant to leave the driveway. The windshield wipers struggled against the snow's slushy onslaught. The heater refused to crank up. In just the suburbs, the small hatchback that had become synonymous with my father over the years had skidded twice on the poorly maintained roads. But once they reached the open, well salted and cleared main roads, things began to look up. With no traffic in sight and the winds calming down, they managed to avoid any further slips. My father relaxed, to the extent someone could in a snowstorm with a laboring woman, a mistake he later admitted was the gravest. Suddenly, what seemed like a pile of snow obstructing the road appeared ahead. Overconfident, my father attempted to drive over it, only to find the car wedged in the surprisingly solid slush. Neither reversing nor accelerating could free them, leading my father to exit the car to attempt pushing or digging them out. That's when he discovered he hadn't hit a pile of snow. He had collided with the colossal form of the white man. At the sound of his faint shriek, my mother asked him why, but he was at a loss for words. He didn't have the luxury of time to narrate a lifetime of supernatural torment, nor did he believe this was the appropriate time or place. It's nothing. I was just startled, was his vague reply before closing the door and coming face to face with the beast, who returned his gaze with beady eyes. Again, there was no outright confrontation. The white man seemed more intent on brokering a deal, seeking to collect a debt. Twice in one year, no more. Keep in mind, my father was not a particularly quick thinker, and it took him a moment to decipher what the white man meant. When the meaning finally dawned on him, the white man echoed it, seemingly to confirm. The white man proposed that if he offered his unborn sons, their debt would be deemed paid. It seemed simple enough, but my father adamantly refused. He wouldn't offer his sons as replacements, no matter the circumstances. There was a final attempt from the white man before he conceded. There was no clash, although my father would later say, I would fought him if I had to. Fortunately, it didn't come to that. The white man quietly slid away from under the car, disappearing into the snowy landscape, unnoticed. You might be wondering naturally what my mother's interpretation of events was. My mother believed that the car had merely gotten stuck in the snow, and my father had somehow managed to free it. If there was a colossal creature, she never saw it. My father returned to the vehicle, drove her to the hospital, and she gave birth to two healthy boys, myself, the slightly older, and my brother. Despite being born three, four weeks early, we were somewhat small but not frail. You might have expected a more climactic conclusion, but there was none. However, if you've been paying close attention, you would have noticed something intriguing. I've mentioned a younger sister, but never a brother. To preempt any confusion, my slightly younger twin brother did not somehow transform into my sister. The birth process went reasonably smoothly, although my brother and I stayed in the hospital for a few extra days to monitor for any health complications. Over the next month, life continued fairly normally albeit with my father showing more anxiety than usual during the winter months. Why had the white man, who had demonstrated such interest in us, suddenly vanished? Why hadn't it taken anything else? There hadn't even been any missing persons, which seemed to occasionally satiate its hunger and the curse. Things escalated in mid-February, ironically enough, on the day my brother and I were initially due to be born. My brother and I shared a room, each in separate cribs. 
My mother wasn't particularly skilled at caregiving, and my father often took up that mantle. So when I began wailing in the middle of the night, it was he who came to investigate. It was also him who discovered the window beside my brother's crib was open. My brother wasn't missing. He hadn't vanished like the pigs, the dog, or my uncle who swerved off the road into a lake. They didn't distribute missing person flyers for him like they had for the unfortunate man who tried to assist my 16-year-old father after his car accident. My brother was merely deceased, a lifeless body in a frigid crib in a room too chilly for infants. The official cause of death was SIDS, though I'm certain the diagnosis would have been different had my parents not shut the window before the paramedics arrived. My father's logic regarding the white man was frequently flawed. Why did the white man sometimes leave bodies, my brothers, grandfathers, and other times not? Furthermore, some of you have pointed out logical inconsistencies. Why didn't he just renege on his deal? Why didn't he claim two boys and everyone else? Honestly, who can say? My father never had answers for these questions either, but he was convinced that since no one else perished, it was that year's interest. Before proceeding to the next part of the story, I feel compelled to say something else. My mother wasn't a good mother, at least not when I was an infant. I am certain she loved me, and she was definitely my preferred parent. We shared more interests and had deeper conversations. But she was not an effective mother when I was a baby. She detested infants, was indifferent to children, and would have chosen not to have kids if the decision had been hers alone. She suffered severely from postpartum depression, which didn't fully resolve until my sister was about three. Considering this, it's important to note that she was the last one to tend to my brother and me before going to sleep. This may sound like I'm outright blaming my mother for the incident, but that's not completely accurate. I think it could have been an accident on my father's part or perhaps even a botched kidnapping attempt. I've always believed it was a possibility, and I suspect my father was aware of that too. My uncle never knew about the open window. My grandparents didn't either. Only my mother, my sister, my father, and I knew the window had been open. And that's because my naive father included it in the narrative he told us. Years later, I questioned my mother about it. She confirmed it, saying they had closed the window before the paramedics arrived to appear less negligent. She asked me never to disclose this to anyone. Despite this crucial detail being omitted from the official account, others also harbored suspicions. It's essential to mention that the white man was never my scapegoat for these events, unlike for my father. To me, it was merely a chilling tale he would recount, which I thought others might enjoy. My grandparents never fully bought the SIDS explanation. My father developed a habit of making sure all windows were locked and that we were safe in our beds before going to sleep, a practice that persisted until my sister and I were beyond the age where an open window could prove fatal. Afterwards, it was the death of my paternal grandmother that my father attributed to the white man. My grandmother, who had always struggled with self-care, had wandered into the woods near her trailer. That's where she resided and wasn't discovered for three days. The official explanation was that her wood-burning stove, yes, in a trailer, had run out of fuel and she'd ventured in to replenish it but got lost. Given how my grandmother aged and suffered a few final setbacks, it's conceivable that she was simply senile or ill-equipped to navigate life without her spouse of almost 30 years. The only time I met my grandmother was at her funeral, when I was barely a year old. There's a photograph of us, taken by my Uncle Philly, with me seated next to her in the coffin. My family on that side, it seems, comes from humble origins. The subsequent year, my other grandmother's Scottish Terrier disappeared on a cold evening, never to return. A hunter went missing the following year. An aunt discovered the corpse of her cat hanging from a tree. Each of these events was attributed to the white man. Now this is probably nothing, as it's probably been nothing these last 30 years more than nothing. But it's an interesting thought, and I'm sure you'd be upset if I didn't include it. Now I hope you've all enjoyed my story. I know it's long, but I felt you'd appreciate it. Maybe there is a boogeyman. I wouldn't mind. Not at this point in my life, because if he's coming for me, I'm ready for him. I must take two males for your two boys. Alright, so how much of this story is based on assumptions from the father? Like he's thinking that this creature wants is a guide to the afterlife, kind of like a shepherd that helps people who are near death. And with a lot of other paranormal stories, the people in, in his life, uh, some people thought he was crazy. Some people thought he had mental illness. And he did have nervous breakdowns. He seemed to break down a lot, like at the party where he had a panic attack and was freaking out. And maybe he did have this encounter. Maybe he almost died as a child and had an encounter with this being. And because his life was saved by it, 
he believed that he had a contract or a debt that he owed the creature for it not taking his life. And for the rest of his life, until the young age of that he died, he, only, he died at 55 years old, which isn't very old, he had numerous encounters with this creature. Now, one of the things that I thought was kind of interesting is this creature kind of sounds like the rake or the Dover Demon or even a Wendigo. It's a very tall white creature that only comes out in blizzards or snowstorms. It's a pity that the father didn't put in any more descriptions, but the mere fact that the father was terrified of this creature for the entirety of this guy's life, the guy who was writing it, kind of makes me believe that he was really terrified of something. He saw something in the woods, but he wasn't quite sure. But we can't really be sure. The depictions of it sound kind of like what you hear people of people seeing with the Wendigo or the rake or the flesh gate or whatever a, a very white humanoid looking thing that uh, walks around and kind of just looks at people and runs away there aren't very many sightings of those things and maybe the reason there isn't that many sightings is because most people who see them it's the last thing they see and maybe this guy was legitimately lucky and didn't have his life taken so he had a more intimate encounter with it than anyone else and on a side note my last video took three days to upload my internet is extremely slow quintillion the internet service provider we use fiber optic cable in the ocean uh, the ice broke the cable and for over a month now i've been having insanely slow internet like i could barely watch videos they won't load they won't buffer and uploading videos takes forever so i literally it's kind of discouraging me a little bit for making videos because i make a video and then i try to upload it and i leave my laptop open all night uploading all day all night the next day all day the next day and it's a hassle but i'm still trying to release at least one a week this video is a little different than normal because it's only one story and one analysis but i will make another video talking about these slender really white humanoid like creatures the problem with a lot of paranormal stories is unless we have a huge sample set to take information from like let's say we only have one story of this white man creature we can't really determine commonalities between other people who have encounters with it so we don't have very much information to go off of but it did terrify him for his whole life until the day he died so that's something Anyway, if you like this video, remember to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you have any information that you want to tell me, email me at thezenohunter at aol.com. It's my new email. Or comment in the comment section, and I'll get back to you. Anyway, this is Kitavitok, the Xeno Hunter. Until next time, peace out, guys.